one common denominator that they all have. Thousands of hours logged on first person shooter video games. A lot of these kids are reenacting the scene that they have done the most in their video game. A lot of parents now, they've given up the controls and let technology lead the way. We need to have personal accountability, we need to have self-accountability, and we need to understand that the only thing that's gonna fix this thing called society is by us. The nuclear family, I believe, solves a lot of societal challenges. When there's an engaged mom and there's an engaged dad and they're parenting together. At the end of the day, we are our own worst critics. Where we've nitpicked something that we've done wrong, but it's, it's the getting up every day, it's a new day. Accountability, all right, I messed up yesterday, it's time, let me fix today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Signal Fire Radio, a show where a bunch of military veterans and their friends get together and destroy the villainous philosophy of self-doubt by having encouraging conversations designed to feed the mind, strengthen the body, enrich the spirit, and grow the tribe. I'm your co-host, Rob Renz. I'm joined by our co-host, Brandon Pettyjohn. Brandon, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for You're that. You're sandwiched in between... We, I think our, our tattoo to person ratio is the highest that it's been. I think so. Since we've launched Signal Fire. You're sandwiched between two amazing gentlemen who've both been on the show before. It is June. Uncle Ron, it is June. Uncle Ron needs no introduction, but Ron, I'll let you introduce yourself. Ron Holmes from Riker USA. Welcome back to Signal Fire, my friend. How have you been? Good. It's been a long time. It has been. Yeah, the last, last time was, what, last March or April, I think, right when we did the PACT Act. Yep. I think it was the with, last time uh, that you came Tim, on when Tim, Tim Jensen, Jensen came on. Yep. yep. Which they're <clears throat> maybe that's something that we'll talk about today. They've been really heavily involved in legislation in Missouri to get psychedelic research as a treatment for PTSD. And I just saw something on Will Wisner, the executive director of the Grun Style Foundation, who is here with us too, also, that uh, I don't want to misquote it. Somebody just contributed forty two million dollars in psychedelic research for veteran no treatment so that's awesome yeah will will has will and tim they've been you know pioneers of ayahuasca and psilocybin and all these other alternative therapies that are out there so good job to them and ron now, is it confirmed welcome back. that 42 million dollars was given or was it a hallucination uh great question i don't know i could have dreamed this whole thing <laughs> we're <laughs> talking about we're talking about psychedelics yeah. we could all be in a dream sequence right now well, and i would have absolutely no idea <laughs> jacob's ladder yes yeah. yes exactly uh, yeah we're in deep inception and then chris bradley welcome back What's we said man? we were going to have you back on and then there was like two episodes in between and we didn't but now you're here i'm back here yeah I am. yes i love it uh chris bradley's the owner of Cape Fear Investigative Services. And I'm very, very excited to have these three uh, perspectives, four perspectives if you include my own, because I really want to talk about two things. Community safety, which is an important topic in 2023. Um, but more importantly, how do we get our kids ready? Because everybody at this table has, uh, Chris, how old are your, your, your oldest son? 20. 20? 16. 16 and, and, two. and two. That's yeah. right, so you've got young kids too. So everybody yeah. here at this table has young kids. A lot of the people that listen to this show have young kids. And we have seen, and we've talked about it, Brandon, on a lot of the episodes, that like the generation that's just before us have lived in front of computer screens like mm -hmm. their entire life. And there's been somewhat of a disconnect with the physical world and their skills and abilities to like I I sometimes imagine what would happen if like a 16-year-old kid who's lived on TikTok their whole life, what if they, what if they got lost in the woods? What, what would happen? And they didn't have GPS. What do you think would happen? Yeah, we wouldn't hear from them again, <laughs> ever. Yeah. yeah. Ever. Basic survival skills are kind of a thing that we don't teach kids. Well, like when we were growing up, uh, like I'm pretty sure most people were involved in some aspect, whether Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, like, it, like you know, somebody, there was somebody, there was something out there for you to do, and that's, with the whole Boy Scout scandal that's happened, nobody's putting their kids in Scouts anymore. So, you know, a lot of these basic survival skills are left up to the parents to kind of decide. And if you're not of that nature, um, then your kid's never going to learn that. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we can see, and Ron, you've, you've been so close to it, so much so that you've created a kid's camp here for it. That, you know, was really the impetus for us wanting to have you on and to talk about it. Like, the, the erasure of those fundamental skills it seems to be accelerated with 
the last couple of generations is that outside of your own and how you raise Riker and your friend group and your peer group, kind of give us like some context societally on how you're seeing just that, how to change a tire or how to start a fire. Like, yeah. you know, you know, it, that rhyme. Yeah. I, I look, I look at how my parents raised me and the things that we did and were, you know, we were Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. My parents were our den leaders. You know, so the leadership for me on that started in my home. And um, and I'm also a, a three-time Pinewood Derby champion. Just want to throw that out my there. My man. My okay, man. for all New England. Yeah. Just throwing that down, and I still have the cars. Do you but, really? <laughs> yeah. Do, you, well, do they, They're kind of disheveled because the Riker has them Do now, they ever but, hit you up and like, hey, Ron, why don't you come back and defend the title? No, no. But We I, should put I, something I like that together. VBC, oh VBC, Pinewood, Pinewood Derby. Derby fundraiser. You heard it here first. We'll get it. We'll get it taken so care of. The Ric Flair of Pine Derby. So just, you know, looking at I that stuff that. and then, you know, just being in, uh, you know, in sports and, you know, with time and technology and advances, is, you know, things get better, but sometimes they get worse, you know, with all this AI stuff coming out now. I mean, these people have obviously never watched Terminator and like all of these things that these conveniences they're killing the human spirit they're killing uh, for comfort and laziness like you know uh, art imitates life life imitates art the, it was a book but then became the movie i robot like look at that look at how everybody had the android had the robot doing everything for them right uh the movie surrogate with bruce willis where no one actually lived they just had physical like android avatars and they were just like in a coma base in this tube right you got we've got to start becoming capable human beings of simple things. You know, my sister was taught by my dad to change a tire, to jump a car, to, you know, all these things. You have to know these things. You do. You just can't sit there and just like, you know, you can hope. Let me go on chat and GPT and see if it'll change my oil for yeah. me real quick. Yeah. So um, through, you know, again, my dad passing of my dad in November and trying to instill everything that he taught me into my son and any kid that comes into my house, it's, yeah, you're coming to play, but the same sense is you're going to learn. We're going to do some, some, some simple tasks that's, you know, going to make you appreciate your time at our house. And through that, we've had friends and family who have been like, you should do a camp. And I'm just like, Ugh. you know, I don't even know like where to start with that and how, this all is, and then it just, you know, it came to me, and I started putting this idea together of things that I like that I look at what we do with our son, and and then I came up and kind of over probably I would say since January it's funneled down, and we have our first two pilot schedules locked on, and um, so our, our I think the big thing for me is is, uh, you know, with society we've seen they've taken pride of country and faith out of the public school system um or it's left optional it's not like mandatory i remember growing up we sung the pledge of allegiance and we sung a song like uh in, in any of the songs the, you know that throughout every every day of my life all the way up i think until high school and then it was just the pledge of allegiance um so we're going to start our summer camp which is called life skills we're going to start every day with a pledge of allegiance a prayer and a workout and with the intent to set these youngsters up to be the next generation of leader, of warrior. And when I say warrior, I, I, I mean someone who's going to stand up and fight for their family and defend their, their religious values and defend their country and not succumb and be able to have moral courage to stand up and at six years old, at seven years old, and be like, I can help and I don't think that's right. And that's one of my, my goals with that. And so how can I make things different? How can I have this impact on them? Well, our camp, these kids are actually getting outfitted with equipment. I'm setting them up to go forward and be an asset at six, seven, eight, nine years old. They, they're, not, they're not getting a t-shirt when they come to the camp. They're getting a pack and the pack is gonna have a compass, med kits. It's gonna have um, rope. It's gonna have fire starting materials. It's gonna have all these life-saving things in there. They're gonna have some reference books that they're gonna have. They're gonna be able to, to go back and work on their knots and all these things, things that will come in handy throughout their life. 
But I want these kids to look at these backpacks as superpowers and that they know that when they grab this backpack and they walk out that door and they get in the car with their parents, they know that they're an asset. They know that they can help. So that's kind of like, you know, where I'm at with that. I, I, you know, we, the course, man, we're, we're off course and we need, we need to, we need to do a massive course correction or, you know, what we were all to told, you know, making slight adjustments, it's bold. Not inch, inch. It's bold, dope corrections. We're making bold corrections right right now to get us back, you know, bracket it and get back on target. Chris, you've got a 20-year-old. I do. So you've seen 20 years worth of, from a parent's perspective, that Ron, Brandon, and I haven't really gotten to see yet. Uh, um, what, in your assessment, has been that change uh, in terms of, like, what we're teaching our children um, over a two decade period, has it gotten better in some areas? Has it gotten worse in some areas? Like give your perception of that as the, as the elder statesman, you know, father, <laughs> father so, here. So I think, I think we, with children, all children are individual first off. So my, there's a big difference between my 20 year old and my 16 year old on how they are. Um, my, my 20 year old, he would go outside. He didn't mind going in the woods. My 16 year old is, he wants to know everything about outside. If it's whether it's what's underneath the hood of that car, how some how the how the ocean works, how you know talking about wind direction. I mean, all the stuff that happens in the wood in the woods, right? He wants to know. My twenty year old now, which kind of surprised me, he ended up going in the Coast Guard. So he's in the Coast Guard. So I mean, he's learning those navigational skills in the Coast Guard that. You know, he really didn't act interested in as a child, but now he wants to know. So, um, and then my, my two-year-old, I mean, this little girl, yeah. I'm going to raise her the same way I did my boy. Not ready yet. Yeah, you know, she'll, she'll get there. She's so, just happy to be alive right, right. now. But, yeah. I mean, the difference is, I mean, you know, you guys are in the military, um, you know, coming from that law enforcement background, um, how we brought our children up or how we are bringing our children up is all the same. I mean, we want them to have that basic skill set, their survival skills. You know, we teach them situational awareness. We teach them to watch doors, entry points, exit points, little things that, no offense to the, the manager of a, biz, a local business that doesn't have any military experience or no guidance in that, they're not teaching their kids that. No. But yeah. their kids need to know. I mean, they really should. They should know. They shouldn't walk in a room with blinders on or their cell phone up to their face with their face pointed down and they don't know which end is up. I mean, we've seen, you know, as in law enforcement, we've seen people on those phones walking, facing the phone, no situational awareness, walk in front of in a parking lot, about to get hit by a car. You may have seen it. I mean, just in your everyday life, see it. But, you know, we've seen the other end of it, the bad end of mm -hmm. it, you know, seeing that traffic crash with a, a pedestrian, you know, with injuries or even a fatality from it. Um, so, yeah, so the big situational awareness for me, my kids, I mean, like since day one, um, and then, you know, some other things. Uh, Ron and Ron in here by far is gonna be the expert when we talk about firearms. But my kids were brought up around it. They know, you know, if they ask, if they want to see something, I'm gonna show it to them. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show them how to handle it. I'm gonna show them how it works. Show them how it functions. And then we may go to the range and go shoot. You know, I get that's the question I get in in a lot of my classes. You know, when I, I, we like I said, we teach everybody soccer moms and special operators and everyone in between. And when I run my my North Carolina concealed carry permit class, which is also a pistol one on one class. I really don't know the the abilities, you know, or the confidence level. I don't know what these people are showing up with. So everybody that comes through that gate is, is just a big block of clay, and we get to mold them into a really strong, fundamental, confident, uh, you know, civilian firearm owner in, in our society. But one thing that they all, the ones with parents are like, hey, I got kids in the house, and we got guns, but, like, what do I do? And this is like, well, I was like, it's like you need to fix how you think first. And the thing is, is that when it comes to firearms and kids, they need to learn to respect it. It needs to be looked at as it's a tool, it's not a toy, and they can't fear it. And and I say this as the example, but I, I could take my carry piece off and I could put it in the center of the island in our kitchen and walk outside and cut the grass. And my son, my niece, and my nephew will be in there and none of them will touch that gun because they're all we're, they're all raised in a home with firearms and they're all firearm safety and understanding the difference and understanding the, the purpose of of that tool so yeah it's 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 right there if they want to know you explain it to them and it's a great opportunity when the kids want to learn about those things about something that's extremely dangerous you know if if mishandled so you you take that opportunity to say like okay like this is this is the things these are the outcomes you know and and 
this is what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And I think that, I mean, that's something that we're all fortunate that we have a background in that. Um, because I have many, many parents that come to me that, that, like you said, manager of a restaurant, owner of a, you know, a business, you know, with no military legal background and they, they're student and they're humble enough to go out and seek, seek some, some advanced education. You know, for me, I look at it as that, well, you're putting your trust in me. It's my responsibility now to mold you and make you an asset in my society. Brandon, did you did you grow up in a household that was like, you know, you got your dad would take you shooting and stuff like that? Yeah, I grew up hunting. Uh, we grew up with firearms in the house. Um, you know, I was one of those kids that I always wanted to learn about things. And I remember being very young and my dad had gotten me like a foldable knife and he was like, hey, you know, I'm going to put it up for now. Like, we'll we'll like go through everything. It was like the day after I got it. Well, they all went to work. And so, like, I was like, I opened it, and I was like trying to close it and just like cut my fingers up, you know, like just being young and dumb yeah. and learning, right? Yeah. And so, like, you know, my dad, like, you know, we went through all the firearm safety and, you know, did hunter education courses and all that. And uh, it's like a stark difference between my wife and I. So my wife grew up in a very sheltered, never around firearms. And so, you know, like her parents were, or, you know, of guns she was afraid of guns right and so like i had to kind of change her mindset kind of like what you're talking about is it's not it's not something to be intimidated by it's a tool you know it's not going to just go off you know um i remember you know we first got together and she's like you know why are you walking around with one in the chamber I'm like well it's a really freaking heavy paperweight yeah. without one yeah <laughs> I mean, yeah it makes exactly. no sense they're not just going to go off and it's that the problem is in society our, our news cycle it you know we're talking you hear about negligent discharges, which happens, special operators in D all the time. Um, and, you know, not all the time, but it happens. Um, but, you know, people in D and it happens, but you got, that's because they're being negligent. That's the end in that. You have to be, you, you have to be cognizant of the power that that thing has. And until you're a hundred percent confident um, with a firearm, you can't expect other people to be. So you need to fix yourself so that you can fix others. And that includes your children nieces nephews everything like that if you're not confident you're not gonna be confident do you uh ron you've done the research on this um and i i we're just gonna go there because it needs to be done the school shooting that has increased school shootings that has increased dramatically since columbine which was what 96 97 something like that mid 90s mm -hmm. that was the first one we remember happening in the country it was the first one i think that happened in the country um it seems more and more prevalent first one that was that grew the biggest traction yeah 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 well d yeah i remember the media cycle around it and everything the news helicopters like it was it was it was front page news as it as it should have been um there there's a lot to be said about you know we've the mental state of these people i've seen a lot of research about the pharmaceuticals that children at that age are being prescribed that can lead to an increase in some of these suicidal or homicidal ideations or tendencies but from what are you seeing as a there's no root there there is a root cause and then there's a lot of symptoms of it but what are you seeing it from your perspective as a community leader in the firearms industry um and and coaching and training and development what are you seeing as that as that common problem or connecting red thread between these things um what We'll start with, there's a really good book by Colonel Grossman, and you guys probably are familiar with On Killing, and then his other book, On Combat. Mm -hmm. He has another book that came out a few years ago, I think it's maybe three, four years old, it's called Assassination Generation. And it's about going back to Combine, it's about the, the school shooters and the mass shooters and stuff like that. And the one thing he breaks down, he's, you know, he breaks down the statistics in this book, it's phenomenal. And he breaks down like the media wants you to believe it's psychotropics. It's all of these things. He says there's one common denominator that they all have. Thousands of hours logged on first-person shooter video games. And they said you go back through and a lot of these kids are reenacting the scene that they have done the most in their video game. Now, I'm not saying the video game is the end-all, be-all. But if you look at, we're talking about how we started all this. You're, you're, you're you know, a lot of parents now have given up the... The controls on how to lead how to lead their family uh, you know whether it's a single a single parent home single mom or single dad right they've given up the controls and let technology lead the way so these kids are getting disconnected they don't have that that leadership in the home 
They don't have that. They don't have the value. They don't have the the consequences that are like, hey, look, I told you to take out the trash. I didn't even take out the trash. Okay, well, guess what? You know, now I'm taking the front tire off your bike. You can't go anywhere for a week, right? So consequences on, on things and, and, and accountability, teaching these kids to essentially be responsible for their actions, have the moral courage to be like, I messed up, instead of just sitting there and, you know, disconnecting. And then when you get your, your, your feathers ruffled, they're like, oh, your first instinct is like, well, I'm going to get a gun and I'm going to kill you. And the thing is, is we have over 22,000 gun laws. And I would be willing to bet that 21,400 of them are all redundant. And they all just like, this senator, this kind, whatever, they're like, I, I changed this word. And like, yeah, I just got this passed. It's, it's, it's an injustice to the Constitution. It's an injustice to the taxpayers and, you know, and the people that voted these people into office. We don't need more gun laws. All right. We need training. We need education. But the thing is, is that you can't. Ladders, hammers, and box cutters still kill more people a year than than an individual uh, carbine or a pistol, right? They still kill more than that a year. Drunk driving, texting and driving, teenage drivers still kill more people. But people decide to cherry pick death. So, well, it's acceptable that like people get go out, get drunk, and crash into, you know, a family of six, people accept car death because we all have stuff to do, right? They're not willing to give up their car, but the easy target is always the gun. It's always that pawn, right? Just, it's like, it's almost like the, being a veteran, right? You know, and like, oh, we're going to cut, we're not going to pay the veterans. We're going to cut the vet veterans pay. We're going to cut the vet, you know, the VA benefits. We're doing all these things. We're just constantly using us, shifting it around as a pawn. So I don't think it's any one particular thing of, a psychotropic. I think it has a lot to do with the leadership in the home. I think it has uh, um, it has to do with their environment, the things that they see. So if your all your friends are you know single family homes, and all your friends are spending hours and hours, like all the way you communicate is playing you know your your video game system, then you don't have anything else. You don't have any you know you haven't done any struggles. You haven't done anything to to challenge you and to give you a, a, a higher level of thinking, of critical thinking, when you're faced with something that angers you or something that, you know, challenges you this way and that. You know, if, you, if you're looking at, too, is, is look at, you know, you, you want to talk about narratives and this, that, and the other, but, you know, one of the things that kind of also inspired me for the summer camp was the Uvalde shooting, okay? Um, every single one of those cops needs to be in jail. They need to be in jail. They failed. Those kids died because they're, they are negligent. They should all be in jail. Um, and when you sit there and you wait for 90 minutes, well, those kids are sitting there bleeding out, right? Now, what inspired me for the camp, I know I'm getting a little off, but um, the teacher was down. Had one of those nine-year-old kids been taught in thoracic injuries, they might have been able to prolong life because those, those the cowards were waiting to go in, right? Um, we saw what just happened, what in Pennsylvania, that, that former Marine mm -hmm. and a uh, PD and then a sheriff who's never trained together. And those dudes took the fight to the threat. Yeah. They went in there, they were first on scene and they're like, we have got to save these kids. Yeah, and that was, they released the body cam footage. Cause I think you those showed us that were, Brandon, that dude was and, awesome. Yeah. And they moved really quick through that. And I, that was the first time that I remember seeing like body cam footage released that quickly. I think that with was the, the, fatal, the Nashville one. Maybe Nashville. Nashville, Nashville, the ones they, le they released the body cam footage on. Yeah. Um, no, he's a former Marine too. He was, yeah, it was. great. I mean, I'm, but I'm, the, the irritating yeah. part of that. So, um, you know, coming out of the law enforcement world, um, I taught active shooter to yeah. law enforcement. And that, that you know what, the body cam footage was great. What pissed me off was a sergeant that stood in the hallway or stood in the stairwell and was telling guys where to go. That's not his job. Be a leader. Yeah. He failed to lead that day. And, and that, kept, ir that irritates me. And they kept no stopping because they wanted the long gun in front. But you don't and need a like, long gun in the front. front. Like, I mean, I have shown... I have shown the disadvantage of a long gun. There's agencies out there. I mean, I'm not going to like like call agencies out. There's agencies that are trying to teach guys how to move in an active shooter situation with a shield. I'm like, you're stupid. Put the shield down. Go to the threat. Your your shield is that that 
that soft body armor that you got on. You know what? You get paid to do a job. Your job is to go in there and protect life, period. End of discussion. Mm -hmm. Stop teaching these guys. Slow down. Wait for somebody to show up. No, you go there. You go there. If the door's locked, you know what? You're driving a 3,500-pound-plus vehicle called a Dodge Charger. Drive it through the front door. Let's go. I agree. Completely agree. You know, and when you look at for, and you could support me on this probably, Chris, is that law enforcement is hired for a job they're not trained or allowed to do. And when they do it, they're facing unemployment or legal consequences. There's no big initiative for them. There's no incentive for them not to, anymore. to uh, be good at your craft, right? to invest into yourself, to invest in your teammates, in your department. There's no incentive there for there, them. There was a shift a long time ago. I mean, I remember, you know, I mean, I, I come from a family of law enforcement. My grandfather was in law enforcement for 34 years. My dad was in law enforcement for a while. Um, and then and then I did it for 20 years. When I first got into law enforcement, I mean, you really, you wanted to get better at your craft. That mm -hmm. you, you got better. You know, you put your face in a book. You studied. You went out. If, it, if you sucked at driving, you got better at driving. And if mm -hmm. you sucked at shooting, you went out You on your off time. You would go buy a box or two of rounds. You know what? Hey, there's some dry firing drills you can do. Learn to dry fire. It's okay. You're not going to hurt that weapon. But shouldn't, now it's not the same. Shouldn't that be the standard for all crafts, though? You would think you so. You know, like where, so maybe, and maybe this is where, we, you know, we kind of bring it back together to Ron's camp and and going back to the youth and to how kids are being raised right now. It just, it feels like people are trying to fill roles to earn a paycheck, but they're not really becoming students of whatever it is that they've chosen to do and we see standards oh my gosh it drove me freaking crazy today two people that i talked to today that i need to do something um were like i'll, I'll get to it shortly and i and this was maybe the third or fourth time that i had asked them like hey where are we at with things so like my patience had expired on it and i said okay i need you to define for me when is i will get to it shortly i need a time and a date for you just so i can understand and lo and behold, within two hours, I got what it was that I was asking for, even though there was two weeks previous where I was like trying to be a good guy. So this like this reduction in standards of our quality of work or our, our quality of output, it seems to be somewhat universal in some areas. And Brandon, are you seeing that you work with a t across a lot of different spectrums and yeah, you different know, industries? To me, I think, you know, and kind of going back to what Ron was saying, I, I think to me the root problem for our society um, of all these issues that we brought up is, is self accountability and personal accountability. Okay. Um, you know, when you look back to Columbine, the parents were like, you know, Hey, he spent a lot of time in his room. He's playing Diablo or whatever game it was. That was like when the first like, Oh, video games could be the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, no, I'm a shitty parent and I just didn't love them. I didn't support them. The same thing with, you know, with like we were talking about earlier with guns, you know, Unfortunately, you know, guns are a pawn in this political game, but we can't ignore the fact that the number one leading cause in America of youth deaths, juvenile deaths, is guns. And it's not school shootings. It's it's negligence because the parents don't have personal accountability. They're going to say, oh, it was a gun. A gun went off. No, because you left the fire. You didn't train your children. You didn't train yourself and you didn't lock it. You're the problem. Mm -hmm. Personal accountability. Same thing with, you know, with knowing your craft, knowing your job, being accountable is so huge. And look, I'm not perfect. You know, I, I've blamed other people for things, but you got it. Part of growth is understanding that there's only one person that can, that can absolutely change the trajectory of your life. And, and because of that, the ones around you, your family, your kids, your spouse, it's you. So I think the biggest problem that we have as a society that leads to all these issues that we're talking about is that personal accountability. And that's why Ron having this, this program where, you know, again, course correction, right? You know, the, the people that are going to be sending their kids to this camp because they see that there is a value that they didn't get and that they're going to be able to course correct for their children. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, it, it takes somebody, you know, especially if you get somebody that isn't familiar with firearms, isn't familiar with uh, land navigation, all these things that send their kids there I think that's a really good sign that they understand that, look, I missed out on this. You know, my parents didn't teach me this, but I can help my kids. And they see that there's a course correction that needs to be made. We need to have personal accountability. We need to have self-accountability. And we need to understand that the only thing that's going to fix this thing called society 
is by us not demonizing arbitrary things, not polarizing, not, you know, hating each other because, you know, somebody votes one way, somebody votes the other way. Let's just get our shit together. Let's be accountable for ourselves. And in that, we'll create a society or re revitalize a society where people care about one another. You know, it's. Are you sure you want us to put this out? Because the more self accountability there is, the less legal liability there is, and that I mean that has a direct impact on yeah, your you business. Yeah, luckily that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, so. right. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about a big ambitious goal right there. Yeah. Well, I think we I think we're over the target now. So let's let's talk about this round robin, ways to build self accountability, to be more accountable to yourself, and thereby those people that are around you. Ron, what are, you and I have gotten pretty close over the last couple of years. I see it from the outside on the things that you do. Um, but what do you, how do you hold yourself accountable to the, whether it's your value systems, your principles, those, those that are under your charge, yeah. what's your, what's your go-to methods? It's funny. It's, you know, it's, it's, and, I, and I, I say this all the time, but Muhammad Ali has one of my favorite quotes. And he said, if you're the same man at 40 that you were at 20, you've wasted 20 years of your life. Mm -hmm. You have to continue to evolve and change and reevaluate yourself. You have to quote David Goggins. You got, got looking at mere accountability, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Old Goggins. Um, so you got looking at that, miles today. <laughs> you got looking at mirror of uh, accountability, right? And you have to, you have to constantly, I mean, seek self-improvement. One of the leadership traits that we, you know, we were, it was beat into us, right? Always seek self-improvement. And how can I be better today? And, you know, becoming a and again, I'm an old dad, and I and I love it. I love it. I'm getting ready to be 52. My son's getting ready to be seven, and I I'm a better dad, have starting in my late 40s than I ever would have been prior to that. Which, I, I I know that. Quick side note: you being in your 50s gives me hope for when I'm in my 50s because you're still a cool ass 50 year old. Hey man, you know when you're 18, 19, 20, you're like, dude, 50. That's they're old. And then you meet somebody like Ron, you're like, shit, man, 50s are going to be awesome. Yeah. I'm well, sorry. And, and I don't want to I don't want to take it too far off that, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's cool to see we've all seen in our in our community veteran LEO community where guys wash out and kind of give up, and it's cool to see like you said like that personal accountability, getting better, making yourself better. You know, I'm in better shape in my mid 30s than I was in my early 20s, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps still. And you know, it's because I want to get better. You know, I, I want to be a better version of myself for my family, my kids, everything like that. So accountability of the self, right? And lead your family. So everything, find your spiritual guidance, you know, and then find your physical uh, capabilities, right? Because, you know, if you're, go if you're going to, when I teach the situation where in a seminar, I always ask people like, who has an alarm system that you guys pay for a month? Half the, typically half the class will raise their hand. I'm like, how many of you guys actually use it? If I had a class of 20 people, 10 raised their hands. When I asked how many of them actually use it, it's usually about three. Mm. And I was like, okay, so why don't you guys cancel today and you guys just start sending me a check for 60 bucks. Right, you know? yeah. Because that's what you're just wasting money, right? If you're paying for something, if you're paying for a service, you need to use it. You need to look at that. You need to look at that as, as in the mirror of accountability every day. I have to pay the rent, okay? How am I going to do that today? First, I got I to gotta get right with God. I got to work out. I'm setting the example right there. My feet hit the ground 4.30 in the morning, and I'm up, and I'm doing my thing. And I'm, I've am i already gotten up, cleaned, you know, put the dishes away, got the house ready for the day, and gone to the gym before my son is up. Mm -hmm. And I am now setting my tone for the day. So now I can, I got my hard stuff out of the way. Now I can focus on on him and leading him and teaching him. You know, and again, we all know we're parents. It's not it. It's not homeschooling is what we're doing, and it's it's awesome. But it's not without its challenges, and it's not without its its difficult moments, especially when you you have a very headstrong child. But this is where you have to rely. Now you have to to realize that again, like when we put our faith into God, that it's not us. We're not doing it by ourselves. And in the home, you're not doing it by yourself. You have. If you have that home, you have that the, the benefit of having two spouses, you know, the, the husband and wife in, in the home to raise the kids. Now you have to communicate. And I mean, and we all, we all, we all, 
probably struggle with this and we, we all do good and we all we all do bad you know but you have to you know it's um uh what's his name colin cowherd said it. you know he's like one of the things that you can tell in a court a great quarterback is they have a short-term memory they throw an interception they come out the next series they throw a touchdown mm -hmm. they're not letting that one interception kill them they're not letting it stop the momentum of the rest of the game make a decision if it's a poor decision make a new decision and keep moving forward right so just stay in the fight you know stay in the fight be a leader find find something will smith said when he did the movie which i don't know if you guys know it was a remake was um what was the one with the zombies oh, oh uh, uh he is legend i am so legend. Yeah, legend. 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 legend is the you band. know that's yeah. a remake is it really no, yeah. yes it's a remake from um omega man with charlton heston from the 70s that. yeah so in the green uh, logan's run and omega man you guys need to check them out if you haven't yeah. like because they're all coming true right now mm -hmm. um but in there he, one of the things that he said in the preparation he talked to prisoners and he talked to prisoners of war on uh, to help him prepare for that role and they the common thing between them both was routine regardless of what it was if you were like you didn't leave yourself for today you had to have your routine you had to do certain things mm -hmm. to keep helps you keep your sanity mm -hmm. so you take that and you apply that to everything you do in your life like when i teach the situation awareness when i leave the house when i grab my my edc bag i know it's in my edc bag but i'm constantly in my bag check mostly because Riker likes to go in and take stuff yeah, off. Yeah. But I'm Dad, constantly, I need this quick clock. I'm constantly, yeah, I'm constantly <laughs> inventorying all my stuff. Yeah, I need quick clock yeah. for my, my stuffed otter. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, we just yeah. got a gut shot, just right? sprinkling it over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, you got to constantly inventory your gear. And I, this is why we're calling the camp life skills. It's it's a lifestyle and, and it takes 21 days to create a habit. It takes 90 days to create a lifestyle. I'm not perfect at all of it. I I get lazy. I get tired. Uh, I you know I get consumed, um, and uh, you just have to, you know, when you feel yourself like mm, you know like you know what it, I haven't gone to the gym. Mm -hmm. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. You know what I haven't gone to the range. I haven't you know when's the last time I cleaned my gun? You know this these, these things. When's the last time I cleaned my my fishing gear? When's the last time I like actually looked under the hood of my car mm. you know um and like that's actually my uh service plan just expired on my truck and i'm sitting there and i'm like damn i'm having to pay for oil changes and tire rotations i'm like i can do all that yeah right so now i'm like now but then i'm like wait this truck has a computer so now i've got to go to youtube and i'm finding videos on how to change the oil in the f-150 but i'm going to start becoming self-reliant again like i did as a kid mm -hmm. because i also have the ability to teach myself and also remember what I was taught. And I just have to learn things a little bit different now because stuff is different. But um, consistency, accountability, and, and, and move forward one problem at a time. Control what you can control. Yeah. And, and continue to plan. He touched on one thing, and I, I don't want to breeze over it. Um, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, if when you're a parent being accountable to your kid. And I, I look at accountability as just doing what you say you're going to do, right? I think that's just such an easy way to define it. Um, but, you know, I'll kick this question over to you, Brandon. But, Ron, you touched on it, like, you know, uh, when we went going back to the increase in school shootings and single-family parents and stuff. That spouse-to-spouse -spouse accountability for doing – for solving some of these things, which I think – you know, the nuclear family, I believe, solves a lot of societal challenges. I'll just – I'll throw that right out there. When there's an engaged mom and there's an engaged dad and they're parenting together um, and they're on the same page and they're they're – teaching values and their teaching principles we can see all the statistics out there that say that they that kid is going to be set up for a better and better can be defined differently we look at success as like financial success but um you know just a better overall quality of life being married is not simple mm -hmm. getting married is hard staying married is probably even harder um especially getting, getting when you have easy yeah, it, yeah, maybe get, maybe the getting married part is the easier part, right? I think today it's gosh, I would hate to date in today's environment, man. I have no idea how to do it, no idea how to do. It. Used to go to a, used to go to a bar and just pick somebody right. up, and and then you're like, hey, can I buy you coffee or can I take you dinner? Now there's phones and all this matching data metrics. I don't know, mm -hmm. but talk a little bit about that, Brandon. Like the, um, you got to be accountable to yourself. You got to be accountable to your kids. How about being accountable to your spouse? What 
what are some ways that our listeners can just like work on that part of yeah, it? Yeah, you know, I, I so I think I have two kind of points of view on this. You know, being a lawyer, I do divorces and deal with child custody stuff too. And so it's not just you know, yeah, you're right. The nuclear family, um, you know, statistically, you know, you're there's better outcomes when you have a mother and a father in the home. But when that's not the option, um, that personal accountability, that self accountability piece is saying because you know 50 percent of marriages in a divorce right you know that's the statistic we've always heard so like you know you're going to know somebody's divorce and, and a lot of kids i come from a divorce home and um a lot of kids do and so what you need to know is it's that accountability just because mom and dad didn't work out you need to put your shit aside and be there for the kid right you know you need to have the same values you need to be in agreement so that Everyone is on the same page. It's the same thing with a spouse, right? I mean, I'm so busy, you know, all the time. You know, I I get up at 430, I work out, I leave the house, I'm back at like 8 o'clock at night most nights, you know? And so my wife and I have to have a, you know, kind of debrief every night Mm -hmm. to make sure that we're on the same page, you know, when because she's at home all day with the girls. And so when I come home, I need to be able to implement the same things that she's implementing, and and we got to be on the same page about it. Um and the same thing with having discipline with, you know, when I get home, you know, she she was telling me last night, she really appreciates that I get home, you know, busting my ass all day that I, I was cleaning the kitchen, doing those sorts of things. Because you have to, you know, even though I'm out doing these things for the family or, you know, working out, doing these things for myself as well, you, you need to have, you need to have that peace with your spouse too, because if not, then, you know, you're, it, it's all going to fall apart. And so you got to think about the bigger picture. Being married is super hard. You know, it's never, you know, they're, there's times when it's blissful and it's great and there's no issues. But if anybody's been married for any certain amount of time, you know, I've been married 11 years now, almost 12. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough. There's, there's tough times and, and, you know, fortunate that we were able to fix our stuff and and adjust fire and move out. But, you know, not everybody else does, but the thing that you got to remember in those times is bigger than you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's bigger than you, especially when you have a family and that's kind of way that I look at it. I look at that with my community. I look at that with, my business, you know, it's bigger than me. Um, I, I'm not in it just for myself. Do I get pleasure, gratitude out of all this? Yeah, but those are small potatoes. You know, what I'm really excited about is seeing my kids grow up to be successful. Um, you know, just last night, my my daughter, so she started jujitsu about, she's four, she started jujitsu about five months ago, three, four months ago, maybe. Um, and we took a picture of her last night, and it was just really cool to see the confidence that she has. When she first started, you know, she was, like, real shy. Her shoulders were shrugged. Last night, she took a picture, and she, like, she legitimately looked like a world champion. Yeah. She was like, just, like, you know, she was beaming. Just laughs She's out, out there freaking sleeping up. kids. You yeah. know, she is putting it to him. And th- that was really cool to me because I started jiu-jitsu because I, I wanted my girls in it because I think it's important for a girl uh, or a young woman to have the ability to to – protect themselves, or at least uh, stop the attack in order to disengage and get away, right? You know, jiu-jitsu is all about fighting off your back. Every young woman should know how to fight off their back because we live in a society where people are shitheads and they don't have impulse control and, and something could happen. Um, but, yeah, so seeing seeing my daughter get into something that gives her confidence just dr- drives me to um, be more confident in myself and, and, you know, figure out what I'm doing and make sure that I'm passing down the right values. Um, you know, I don't know how far off topic I got, but no, it, you're it you're, cool you're extremely on topic, and it's a very good story. And it, it 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 you know goes to the point of teach your kids things. Mm-hmm. You know, like important things. Like I I the same for the same reason I want to put the girls in into jujitsu because like they need to they need to know what to do because we live in a volatile world yeah. um, and sometimes a very scary world. And we can't be with them 24 mm-hmm. seven. And so whether they're going to school and I feel confident that they've gone through Ron's program. And if there is a, you know, a situation um, they can administer first aid if necessary, or if some asshole yeah. tries to come at them, they know what to do and they can at least get away long enough to get some help. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Chris question for you then uh, Ron, Ron spoke on it. It's like, yeah, we all try to hold ourselves to a very high standard. Um, we're probably accountable to ourselves about 95% of the time, but there's, you know, times where we get lazy or we get tired and stuff like that. I've always felt that self-discipline is what re-engages self-accountability. What's your perception on that? Um, so along with that, one of the things we haven't really talked about is that self-reflection. 
the self-reflection in the mirror. I mean, we are, at the end of the day, we are our own worst critics. What have we done right? What have we done wrong? We will nitpick to the point, I mean, and I've done it. Ron, prob- you've probably done it. Brandon, you've done it. Mm. You've done it. Where we've nitpicked something that we've done wrong, and it has just aided us. You know, for a little while, mate, maybe a, a, a day, maybe a week. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the getting up every day. It's a new day. You know what? It You can have a failure, but if it, you know what? There is a new day. Tomorrow is a new day. You know what? You wake up, accountability. All right, I messed up yesterday. It's time. Let me fix today. Mm-hmm. I cannot go back and fix my mistakes from yesterday, but today is a new day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, I, um, my son, my oldest, um, he called me after they had an incident on the boat. Um, some guy, and this made this was on the news. Some guy had snuck an M4 onto the cutter or on the on the cutter that he's on, and they found that they found this M4 up underneath his rack, and they were, I mean, it was it was nasty. Well, and my son was like, Dad, he's like, this guy was planning on doing something on the boat, and I said, and I said, let me ask you a question: Have you ever said anything bad about him? He said, No. This was his bunkmate. We'll come to find out. And I said, well, what was he going to do? And he said, well, he said he just didn't like some people on the boat. And he, you know, he really had made some comments that he wanted to deal with certain people. So this guy was planning a mass shooting on the boat. And it got back to certain people. And they ended up taking, you know, taking this guy, put him in the brig. They have a small little brig on the boat um, until they got him back to a port, um, came off, was under, you know, under investigation by, by CGIS. Um, and then ends up getting into a chase down in Florida with some girl that he had picked up with the cops with another with a stolen firearms mother. Man. Wow. So same guy. But, you know, my, my son, had kind of beat him up a little bit. He was beating himself up. He's like, Dad, maybe I, you know, I should have done this or should have done that. It's like, you know what? No, it was dealt with. Tomorrow's a new day. Hey, wake up. Right. Ready, ready to go. Um, you know, my 16 year old is a lot like I am. He knows everything. You can't tell him nothing at this point. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I think lessons in life, finding something, finding something that they really enjoy, that they're passionate about. Brandon, jujitsu, um, you know, Ron, you're, you know, jack of all trades, you know, I mean, you're, you know, you got a bunch of different things, different avenues. My 16 year old, it's weightlifting. Um, I've had people reach out to me that I haven't talked to in a long time saying, hey, I saw your son in the gym. He's going places with this. He's just so meticulous. Um, well skilled beyond his years of something that he's only been working on. He's trying to master a craft of powerlifting. He's been working on it for less than a year. Um, and self-driven. I take him to the gym. I would show him things. Now this kid is, you know, doing amazing things. And yes, he's out squatting me right at this point. And I'm kind of irritated is about this. Is he built like you? He's built like I am, yeah, but, yeah. but bigger. All right, so now it's like, all right, so now dad's got to step his game up because you can't let a 16 year old beat you, right? right? You'll still be out. Right. Hey, hey, You'll still be just, out. Just, just, don't overload it. Hear me out. Hey, have the hard conversation with yourself. Just because I can back squat 450, yeah. do I need to? Yeah, right. That's right. That's, right. that's, right. that's, where, right. that's where the dad wisdom starts yeah. to come in, right? Because, yeah. like, my dad was always like, I don't need to prove to you that I can still beat your ass. I know that I can. Right. You yeah. know, so yeah, it's yeah. just like it's just like all right, he's still the alpha. I'm not going right. to touch him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, but I think the important piece of that, what you were talking about, you know, the success of your son is the support that you've given him. You know? Absolutely. If, if you don't have that support system, um, you know, the Marine Corps, you know, the the supply guys always said bullets don't fly without supply, right? Mm-hmm. But it's true. You know, we need a support system. The entire Marine Corps is set up to support the infantry apparatus. Well, the entire you know home structure should be built to support each other, right? And so you right. got to support your kid, you got to support your spouse, you got to support um, you know, whoever it is that you're you're forming your community around or it's not going to work. Favorite favorite text message from him was today that I haven't I mean, he's always sending me messages when he's at the gym or whatever. He sends me a message with a picture of his hand, he's ripped a callus off. And I said, "Man up." You've made it, son. And, and he, I said, man up, and he lifted for another hour. So nice. <laughs> then you got to eat the dead skin and show yeah. that. Well, you know, there, show was, the there other, was enough the chalk on that rats. hand when he sent me that picture. I'm like, hey, go wash the hand off first yeah. before you eat that callus. But <laughs> so you train, you know, you train, like you said, you know, soccer moms, special operators. You were a police officer for 20 years. What is y'all's perspective of the? You know, we were talking a little bit earlier about, um, you know, the the effort putting into your craft. Did have. Chris, did you see a diminishing of, you know, people's capacity and their craft 
you know, as the generation kind of changed in the police world. Absolutely. And, and Ron, did you have you seen that at all from, you know, having worked with, you know, law enforcement or, um, you know, alphabet agencies in the past and then what you're seeing now? Have you guys noticed a difference? Is it a generational issue? And what's your perspective on why it happened and how we can fix it? I think going back to, I mean, and, you know, Ron and I are a lot closer in age than, than you and I are. Um, when I first went into law enforcement, people went into it because they wanted to. They wanted to be there, you know, and the job wasn't done until it was finished. So, you know, you work a 12-hour shift, call bleeds over to 12 hours, I'm not going to pass it off to someone. You know what? I'm. There was many, many nights. Well, them 12-hour them shifts turned 14, 15, 16-hour shifts. I'm okay with it. The generation now, you know what? They... Their problem solving is different than ours. It's not that it's wrong. It's just different. We we are, you know, head down. We're going to figure this out. They're not like that. Um, you know, but the extra stuff is not there. The guys aren't doing the extra stuff anymore. Um, SWAT was a collateral duty. As soon as I was able to try out for SWAT, here I am. I'm going. Let's go. I loved it. Loved every minute of it. That, that brotherhood was tight in the civilian law enforcement community. I talk to the guys now, they may get, when they have an open tryout, they may get one guy to come out. Mm. That's sad. Yeah. It's kind of like, is it, I'm sure you guys have seen the meme. Uh, I guess it's a meme, but it's um, strong men create good times, mm. create weak men, create hard times, create strong men. Does it feel, Ron, <laughs> like maybe we're kind of circling oh, man, back we're... around and there's a pendulum that's yeah. shifting more towards, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and 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 I, like a lot of the stuff you're seeing, it's like there, there's no such. It's it's not toxic masculinity. It's a lack of masculinity mm -hmm. to lead the children, mm -hmm. right? Yes, you do need. It, it, there needs to be balance, right? We can I'm, we can all agree that there yeah. needs to be balance between a father and a mother, whether the 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 home is together or the home is separated. But co-parenting needs to be it needs to be on the same page, and the parents need to be adults and and. Put their differences aside if it's a, if it's a co-parenting situation, right? So it's you want to find the leadership. You know what you were saying. What uh, what Brandon just asked is about. So <clears throat> I've seen I've seen guys from you know not special operations type backgrounds in the military get out and excel and do amazing things, and then I've seen the same ones who like. Um, didn't and then in special operations most guys are there because they are they want that higher calling they 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 want to answer that call they want that challenge they want they long for the suffering and it it drives them and it motivates them um you know and uh it kind of makes me think of um when i checked back into okinawa in 95 they used to have this thing called the the and i don't know if they still do now but the joint reception center so you check in Okinawa, you sit there, and the base, the the Marine Corps base sergeant major comes in and gives you this brief. And, and in the mid '90s, there was a big rift between female Marines and male Marines. Like, why, you know, why am I per competing against her? We have different standards. I have to do different things. She doesn't have to work out as hard as I do. It was it was all this stuff. And sergeant major came out, and he was just like, until every male Marine runs a 300 PFT. Hmm. And looks good in uniform. Mm -hmm. Shut mm -hmm. your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Shut your mouth. He's and his big thing was police your own. Right. Police your own before you start. Since now the term would be what casting shade. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the military you have incentive. You had you get you promoted. Mm -hmm. You make your career. There's the resident non-resident PMEs. Your P your fitness your fitness levels like that gets you points. It gets you promoted ahead of your peers. Your shooting abilities. Uh, volunteering, doing other things, seeking, continuing to seek self-improvement. There's incentives there. Um, even still, and so you get those guys, you know, with, you see that 1630 Marine, 1630, that dude's already looking out the door, mm -hmm. or the dude is like the last one to leave, right? It just, it just, you know, I think a lot of that, dude, it comes back to, it then comes back to the home. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad raised me, like, you know, my wife tells me all the time, she goes, you're a little too hard on, on him today. And I'm like, um, and I sit there, and rather than be like, sometimes I'm like, no, I wasn't, you know? And then sometimes I'm like, I sit there and I take a breath and I'm like, yeah, maybe I was. Like, mm. 
Maybe I'm I'm talking to him like he's 14 years old and he's forgetting that he's six because of man, he dude, Riker's a punk sometimes, yeah. bro. <laughs> like all little like, boys you know are, man. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Sometimes I'm like, mm, no, no, I wasn't, you know, but that thing is that that leadership. You know, mm-hmm. you want to show them leadership. And I want I want him to be able to step into any situation and take charge. But this is what we're going to teach in the camp. It's not about being the leader. You have to learn to be a good follower. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to be a good follower, you have to be able to support that leader. And even when they're making a bet, this way, basically I'm raising ATLs. Mm-hmm. The assistant team leader that's going to be able to look at a team leader and be like, bro, right. that plan is crap. Make him an asset to the family. Yep. Yeah. One, of my, one of my favorite um, short stories, have you read uh, A Message to Garcia? You read that? I need to read it again. It's good. I haven't read it in a long like, time. It, like, yeah. I had a, I had a, um, I had a senior, I, I had him, he was a captain whenever, um, the dark days I don't talk a lot about after the Marine Corps. Yeah, the uh, Army times. The Army times. Yeah. Um, but... What? Yeah, he'll I'll tell you off camera. It's I did some his, time in the yeah, army. Yeah, um, Brandon done seen some things and did some stuff. No, but uh, you know, I so a message to Garcia is basically about um, just doing the job no matter what it takes, and and at least it understanding that there's a reason for it, right? Yeah. Not 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 necessarily having another reason, right? And there's that there's that transition between you have to be a follower for a certain amount of time to understand how to lead because you can't just jump into something and have the capacity to to be the subject matter expert at it yeah. you know what i mean you have to put the time in you got to be boots on the ground you got to figure the stuff out um yeah and, and so you know you got to learn you got to learn new things yeah. you got to lead you know you can't just lead you got to learn and you got to figure out how to follow but also you know hey either what is it lead follow or get the hell away mm-hmm. The man in the arena is another one that I check in on uh, regularly. Like, yeah, oh yeah. man, Teddy, old Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but we got to wrap up, and I can tell you how I know why. Because Brandon's peck sweat, dude, I am sweating. Brandon's it's Brandon's peck sweat. Degrees in here. Brandon's peck peck sweat lets me know when we're approaching an hour, and clearly they have not fixed the HVAC. Look at these freaking tits, bro. Oh, love it. That's why you go hey. to Shield Jiu Jitsu at five thirty in the morning on Leland, because you can in Leland, because you can get that I goodness out. Yeah. I did, all uh, over I did you. An hour this morning, I'll do three hours. Tonight. You did some Let's stuff, go. man. I love it. I love it, Ron. Uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you about camp, about Riker, about your concealed carry course, or any of your training, where should they go? So, uh, Ron dot Holmes H O L M E S at Riker USA dot com. Um, Riker USA on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Instructor One. Uh, spelled out O-N-E, all one word on Instagram. Also DM me. Um, we will have emails and Instagram and website for the camp. We just want to click, create some content, collect content before we launch that. Uh, so then we'll have an update for that down the road. Yeah. But right now we just kind of try not to put the cart before the horse yet. Uh, just got to, got to feel some things out and I want this project to be great. So ron.homes at RikerUSA.com, RikerUSA social media, DM me, and we do have some seats available. And I'll tell you, honestly, like I'm only planning on doing two pilots, but if the word gets out and there's more people that want, I'm I'm available. I can recreate this, this camp a dozen more wheels, times. Wheels so. turning on it for a long time, mm-hmm. so you'll take it further than just two pilots. I know that. Chris, somebody wants you to find out some bad things about uh, – <laughs> About uh, somebody that they're in a relationship <laughs> with, or they want to go on a running club with you, how can they get in touch with you? Um, CapeFearInvestigative.com. Um, you can do a contact request on there. Reach out to me. Um, call me. Uh, 910-762-4374. I'll answer. I've had a weird thing brewing in my head. Are you able to pull... I have a group thread that's 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Are you able to pull the entire history of that group thread, even though I've had to delete it off my phone every once in a while? We'll talk off camera. I want to share it for the 10-year anniversary (laughs) of our our group thread. We we can talk about that. All right, we'll work it out. Right on. Brandon Petty John at the Port City Attorney. That's right. Anywhere else people can get in touch with you? 910-910-9010. 910-910-9010. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Signal Fire Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure that you like and subscribe. Leave us a five-star review because we love to hear nice things about us. And until next time, go out, feed your mind, strengthen your body, enrich your spirit, grow your tribe, and go be a Signal Fire in your community. And we will talk to you next time.